They teach a lot of things in school, but making and saving money is not one of them. My next guest is already worth thousands of dollars. He's a self-published author, and he's only 13, and he wants to share his secret with other kids. Welcome to the show, author of Kid Trillionaire, John Luzonis. John, such a pleasure to meet you. Yes, it was great to meet you, too. Nice to have you here. I have a question for you. First and foremost, are you a trillionaire yet? Oh, that depends on how many books I get you to buy after the show. Yeah, well. Hope, Just kidding. <laughs> well, probably more than a few. And who would you say you've learned the most from about financial education? Well, my dad, he teaches me every single day, and he pushes me very hard. Mm -hmm. But aside from him, Dan Kennedy is a bit of a marketing whiz. Yeah. He's a legend. And he's not a specialist. He knows everything about every single business and that's why we go to his events. Well it's those uh, resources that really help move move you forward in your goal. Of course I know that you immersed yourself for months and, and maybe years in podcasts and books and online stuff to to learn your way through uh, becoming a financial whiz and so you put it all sort of in this book too. Tell me a little bit about it and how long it took you to write. So my book is called Kid Trillionaire. It's all about how kids can make money mm -hmm. and it took me six months to write it from when I had the idea from writing and publishing it. Wow, not many people can say that they have published uh, a book like this, and you self-published it, right? Yes, through Amazon's Create Space. Through Amazon, such a great service. And people might wonder, how exactly do you make your money? Well, I get a little bit of money from selling the book, but most of it comes from building websites, mm -hmm. uh, editing, and editing and producing videos. I do podcast production, podcast editing, mm -hmm. graphic design, marketing funnels, social media campaigns, pretty much anything on the computer. And so what are you going to do with all the money you've made? Obviously you're saving a lot of it, right? Yes, uh, we're saving it. We're looking for suitable investments right now. Yeah. But yes, we have to, like it says in Kid Trillionaire, you have to hoard your money. I'm never going to catch up to Buffett if I'm not as frugal as he was, right? <laughs> That's true. You have to put it all away. Hoarding is the right word to use, definitely, if you if you want to become wealthy someday. And so the get the Kids Get Rich Club, it's called, is sort of an inspiration to get other kids to do the same thing, right? Yes. So if a kid reads a book and they start making money, mm -hmm. but they want to they wanna make even more, they want to take it to the next level, then the club is where they can learn how to do that. And I share every single thing I'm doing, personal updates, mm -hmm. lessons, while I'm learning at my mastermind groups, <coughs> everything. It's a good club to join, and here we're watching video of you actually out there doing the work. You know, it, it, it takes uh, getting on your feet and getting out on the street and meeting people to really uh, make the money, right? And before we go, what comes after a trillion? Oh, I don't know, but don't tell Congress. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's uh, probably a good thing not to do. It, John, it, pleasure to meet you. Um, you're really uh, advanced for your age. You've even got a Washington, uh, you said, uh, New York Post article written about you, more than a lot of people have at your age. So thanks so much for coming all the way from Manhattan, and nice to join you. Nice Thank to, you Nice much. to meet you, I should say. Thanks for joining me. To order John's book, and for more information, log on to kidsgetrich.com. It's already his show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theconsciousresistance.com and thecedsofliberty.com. So Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the Bipcot No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bipcot.org. So today I am delighted to have on the show John Luzonis, author of Kid Trillionaire book and host of Kids Get Rich podcast. Um, and I just wanted to say that I've been following uh, you, John, for quite a while, uh, and I heard about you through the Tuttle Twins, um, Connor Boyack. He, he mentioned that he bought your book, and he it really impacted his um, son, and so I got it, and I love it, and my kids have been reading it, and and uh, I think these are great things to um, you know in, 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 um, introduce to kids at a very young age. You know, so yeah, so John, uh, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah, so yeah, so let's get right into it. Um, so first, we'll start with um, explain to the listener a little bit about yourself, um, how you got on this journey of becoming an entrepreneur, and what books or personalities um, influenced you along the way. Yeah, so when I was about 10 years old or so, I really wanted some money. And my parents, they've never given me an allowance. But you know, I was I was able to scrape by on Christmas money and birthday money. 
though, really, because when I was little, I didn't want very much. But as I got older, I wanted more and more things and I had less and less money. So I want some money and my parents aren't giving it to me. And <laughs> if I wanted something, I had to figure out how to get it myself. So about that time, I was living in London and I had been learning how to code that year. I had been spending a lot of time learning how to code, build websites. I was helping my dad build his website a bit. And there's a cafe down the street and it was like super famous, not famous, but super popular. Like every, every day after school was over, it was packed. It was like rated on TripAdvisor, one of the top cafes in London, but it didn't have a website. So I went up to the owner, Matt, and I said, Hey, Mr. Matt, do you want me to build you a website? And he said, sure. And I built him one and it took me, didn't take me long at all. Just like a couple hours worth of work. I built it on Wix.com and he paid me 40 British pounds, which I think at the time was around 60 bucks. And I was so excited because I had never made money like that before. I don't remember why I spent it. I probably wasted it on some junk, but it was <laughs> life changing. That's not important, me. right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I literally don't remember. <laughs> probably, probably Legos or whatever. And it was life changing though, because I never, I never made money before. Like, sure, I had like a couple lemonade stands in the past, but they made like nothing and it was gone in an instant it was long hard work and my my mom would pocket most of the funds <laughs> for using her kitchen <laughs> teaching me about taxes and i i had never really i had never really done it before it wasn't never that fast never that easily so i, I was excited and over the next couple of years i i built more websites and i started branching out to other other work too like podcast production that was a big one i did but i also did things like I, I built lists for people online. I would like scrape the web for certain leads that they that they wanted and I put it all on a spreadsheet and I got paid money for that. And I was learning social media, advertising, so many different things. And really that was what got me interested in business and working for yourself and having clients. So let me ask you, um, did you come from a, a family of entrepreneurs or are you the first entrepreneur in your family? So my mom, she's worked at uh, Bank of America for as long as I've been around. My dad, he used to trade derivatives on the Philadelphia Stock Exchange, and he still trades stocks. Uh, but after a while, he didn't really do it so much anymore. But around the same time that I started getting interested in business, he started getting interested in business too. Mm. Uh, he, wanted to, he wanted to help other parents raise their children. So we're, we're both learning entrepreneurship together. Wow, that's awesome. That's awesome, yeah. Um, yeah, the idea of teaching kids about entrepreneurship and business and economics and what is money, how to make money um, is so important. And, and that's one thing that you mentioned in your book, that it's not taught in school. I mean, it's good. It's nice to learn about history and math and science and, you know, that kind of stuff. It's nice. But the thing is, I think the goal of most parents is for their kids to be um, self-reliant and independent, right? And they just don't teach that in the school. It's like, it, I think the value of a government school education is, um, is displayed when after they graduate, after 12 years of being there, all they're worth is a minimum wage, seven fifty an hour job. <laughs> in the eco in the, it, that's all their economic worth is and how tragic that must be. Do you find this? What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, it's they, they teach they teach about mitochondria and whatnot, but they don't teach uh, how to how to forget forget even how to make money. They don't even teach like how to do basic tasks, like uh, not not going to debt and stuff like that. They don't, they teach they teach things that are only useful for certain certain people. Right, right. So yeah, that's one um, definite criticism of the government schooling and like like uh like you um we are a homeschooling family i have a 10 year old and an eight year old um 10 year old uh, boy eight year old girl and we've been homeschooling since 2014 um and you are also i know so i know you're a homeschooler but this is also another thing whenever i see a successful uh child doing whatever it doesn't matter what it is could be programming could be acting um you know could be music um, nine times out of 10, they're homeschooled because yeah. it's like, if they're not, you know, 
it's impossible for a child to devote that much time and energy and resources towards mastering a craft when you have all this time wasted in government school. You know, what is it like seven hours a day or seven or eight at school? Then you come home, you got to do more um, hours wasted for homework. And it's like, when can you do <laughs> anything productive with your life? So, uh, yeah. Do, 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 you, do you notice that also? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We see it all the time. Like most of the teen entrepreneurs I highlight in my in my media, so many times they're homeschooled, like way more than usual. They're they're, they're kicking butt. They're, they're making a lot of money. <laughs> and they're, they can do this because they're homeschooled. They don't have to waste hours in school. Uh, like like their peers and so they have an inherent edge over the competition yeah yeah so okay so let me ask you about your homeschooling experience um did you ever go to any kind of school or did your parents um homeschool from the very beginning with you guys yeah when i was little i went to preschool for a little like maybe like a couple months or so i don't even remember mm -hmm. but i do remember this my dad he he's a big math guy and he was teaching me math at home because mm -hmm. you know he traded stocks he had flexible flexible schedule. So he was teaching me math at home when I was really little. And one day I come home from preschool. I'm like, look, dad, we learned one, two, three. Now I already knew one through 50. So <laughs> he thought he figured, oh, I was wasting my time there. And right. uh, he started reading John Taylor Gatto. And it was around then he decided, you know what, I'm not going to go to kindergarten. So he didn't send me to kindergarten. He didn't send my sister to preschool. And I've been homeschooled my whole life. Wow. Wow. That's, that's great. And you've experienced homeschooling in various countries, right? London and, yes. and where else? Uh, mostly America and London. We traveled the world a bit, but we didn't live there. I see. I see. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of people have been, um, because I, I travel in a lot of, with a lot of homeschool groups. So I meet a lot of homeschoolers and a lot of them became homeschoolers just last year after the vaccine law changed. And then, and then now this year, um, due to the lockdown, a lot of people are for it. Although I, I can't really consider that homeschooling because they're like forced into it. <laughs> that's not, that's not, there's a difference between like being forced into something and then doing it because you see the value in it. Well, I feel like some people are doing it and they're like, oh, this is easy. I like this. <laughs> and they're just, they're not sending their kids back. Some people do that. And, and then there's another uh, set of the population that are like, this is, I, I don't like being with my kids. I want to dump them back into school. I know it's sad. <laughs> really? It's, it's very sad. It's very sad. Um, so, okay, great. Um, so, so uh, let me ask you, like with your homeschooling experience, did they um, have a set curriculum or did they give you mostly the freedom to pursue what you were interested in? So we didn't really have a set curriculum. Mostly what we did when I was younger was we were we like worked on specific things like we focused on things so we focused on math when i was really little and by the time i was seven eight years old i was up to calculus because we did so we did so much math <laughs> that i just didn't need to do it anymore so i haven't i haven't really done math since then I've, well, I've done it here and there to keep myself sharp but so it's, we were free to focus on other things so something i love to play well, i love to play the piano we spent a lot of time playing piano i love to play chess we'll talk about that later so we spent a lot of time working on chess when I was like nine to 11 or so. And most recently we've been working on entrepreneurship. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So, yeah. So let's go into, let's get into some of those things. Um, actually maybe, maybe first give a, give an overview of your book and then maybe we can get into your businesses and your, and the chess and piano. Yeah. So when I was 12 years old, I think. Yeah. When I was 12 years old, we were really getting into this business thing full time and, before I hadn't really started my own business. I was mostly working for other people, right? I, I had clients and whatnot, but I wasn't truly separated from trading my time for money. So we, we started, dad and I, we would brainstorm business ideas together. And I was like, I came up with so many business ideas and we would talk about it. We discuss what the flaws were. And we realized one day I realized that kids didn't know how to make money. Like I knew how to make money. I, I've been making money for a while, but other kids, they didn't know how. And there's nothing really teaching them out there. Like we said, there's nothing, not teaching it in schools. They don't see other kids making money on TV. None of their friends are making money. So we need to help. I need to help reach out to them. I need to teach them how they could earn their own money. So at first I started off with like a little membership site. It was called kidsgetrich.com. That's my website. But back then it was just like a little membership site with some videos on how to make money. And it was all right, but 
what really changed things, what was really a game changer is when I went to a business conference with my dad and we went to a lot of them. Uh, right now I've been to over 20. And that one was a game changer because somebody there, they had a presentation about writing a book and they had like a super simple system for writing your own book very fast. They said you could do it in 40 hours with their system. Well, it took me six months, but <laughs> <laughs> it took me six months, but I had a full good book written in it. It was kid trillionaire, how a little kid can make a big fortune. And inside we, we try to discuss multiple angles, right? With the, I want to talk to the kid and I want to overcome any objections they might have. So first of all, most kids don't even know they can make money, right? They, they don't even realize. So the way I tackle that is I show them all these inspiring stories of other kids making thousands and millions of dollars today. And other kids, they don't want to make money. So I show them all the compelling reasons why they need to make money. And some kids, they want to make money. They know they need to make money. They know they can make money, but they don't know how. So I also have ways that they can learn valuable skills, marketable skills, uh, the best ways for them to make money, tactics like reading, improving yourself, hiring other people to help you make money. That'll, that's going to help them earn even more and really so much more. So that was, that's what we tried to do. We tried to go for an all, all out attack on kids, <laughs> but one that will help them totally oh change their life. Oh, I love it. I love it. That's yeah. It's so great. You know, yeah. Reading the chapter about the, um, the kids that have been successful is very inspiring. You know, it's like, it's like, there's really, there's really no limit to what's possible in the business world. You know, if you have the, um, if you have the creativity, if you have the resilience to bounce back from your failures, um, you know, there's, there's so much that can be gained in terms of experience, you know, and, and money and success, of course. But, but like, like you said in your book, um, fail, even in failure, you can learn a lot, right? And if you are, if you are um, strong enough to learn from your failures, get back up and try again. Um, you know, I, I heard uh, this term. I don't know if you've heard of this um, serial entrepreneurs. You heard of yep. that term? <laughs> I love that term. It's like people that try and try and try and maybe have multiple businesses. Um, it is a great um, Japanese proverb, which is um, fall down seven times and get up eight times. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. So I think Thomas Edison said, was it Thomas Edison? Yeah, he said, I have not yeah. failed a hundred times. I've just found a hundred ways that don't work. Exactly. And you know, if Thomas Edison, imagine if Thomas Edison gave off after the first tenth or even a hundredth right. prototype of the light bulb. Okay. Right. <laughs> we nobody would know who he was. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, yeah, and I think you do a great job uh, inspiring kids. This is so powerful. This stuff is like it's almost like this. These kinds of topics are considered, um, for most people, to be adult topics. They're not meant to be for kids. You know, kids, you're meant to go to school and you're meant to learn about this stuff. You're not meant to learn about economics and business and entrepreneurship. And I think that does a tremendous disservice to them. And I'm so proud with my own kids that um, so I'm a chess coach. That's one, one thing that I do. And I teach classes um, online, group, private, as well as in person, group, private, after school classes. And so what I started doing maybe about a year ago is I would bring my kids with me. And I, I tell them that if they do a really good job in helping me teach and helping me with the little kids, with the beginners, while I focus on the advanced, uh, that I will pay them $5 a class right? Each of them, not both of them, <laughs> each of them $5 a class. And so I think that instills in them a level uh, uh, a respect for professionalism, for us understanding how to talk to people, consumer or customers and how to, how to, um, um, yeah, how to interact and, and just how to be, uh, how, uh, how to learn how to be a business person, you know, um, and, 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 and how to, how to develop work ethic. And I think that's so much more valuable than giving them um, free money every month or every week in the, in the form of allowance for doing absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah. It's almost setting up from like a, a welfare state. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. That's a good analogy actually. Yeah. When you, when you give handouts for doing absolutely nothing, what does that encourage? It encourage laziness, sloth. And, and um, so basically it's, it's, um, it's perverting the incentive structure. Right. Whereas in the business world, 
people are rewarded for, for hard work, for making products that are cheap and high quality, right? And efficient. <laughs> yeah, not doing nothing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so yeah, so, so, so let's get into a little bit of, of um, your uh, businesses that, that you've been dabbling in recently, um, you know, your, your uh, streams of income. So, so how's that looking now? Yeah, so when I launched the book, uh, it, took, it was a massive success. I've sold over 1,200 copies now. And it, it was huge. Everybody loved it, but you know, I couldn't live just off of that. So I, I expanded the, I expanded kids get rich a little more. I got, I have a magazine that I publish every month and well, that's my main source of income. I always say this kid trillionaires have multiple money streams. They have more than one way they make money because you know, if you only have one, one thing to do, you could lose it any day. Okay. Mm. Like anything could happen. A new law could be passed. Right. Maybe you're like shoveling snow. You could break your back or something, mm. <laughs> blow, blow out your back. Yeah. And it's always important to have a bunch of different ways to make money. So for me, I've been trying to experiment every month. I want to try something new to make money. So something that that was re- that went really well for me was something I started during the coronavirus, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, and that was an online chess class. And I started that back in like February, I think. And that was a big hit. Kids loved it. Parents loved it. And I changed it a little bit. I pivoted to a chess club, which is more like, you don't have to come every week. There's no set curriculum, but we focus on good, sound, solid chess principles and good practice regimens. And we play against each other. And that one parents love even more because kids, they go, they want to stay after they're sad when it's time to, time to go. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Hey, 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 that's, that's positive feedback for you, right? They they love being there. You're not making chess boring. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, I I really um, push back when people give this assertion that that chess is boring, because I'm like, you definitely have not either had the right instructor or found the right maybe website or even even just playing. You know, putting a, a, a clock. You know, adding, adding some adding some uh, some time to the game, it makes the game so much more exciting. So there's there's you know if 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 somebody says chess is boring, they just don't understand the game. <laughs> yeah. They're playing it wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, Oh yeah. That's awesome. Um, yeah, that's great. That, that's great. That, yeah. Yeah. My chess, um, my chess classes have definitely blossomed and boomed as a result of this lockdown. So um, that's another thing I, I, I remember in your, um, in your podcast, you mentioned about, um, uh, I think there was one of your episodes called Corona casualties. <laughs> yeah. Corona casualties. <laughs> where um yeah and and just also you mentioned previously that uh that there are certain businesses that are resilient and that can adapt to change in the economic climate um of uh you know various laws and regulations and other businesses can't right other businesses just fall by the wayside and how how important it is like you said to have multiple streams of income to not to not uh rely on just one stream um and that's that's a great that's a great lesson yeah, it reminds me. I actually read a book by Andy Grove. I think he was either the CEO or founder of Intel, and he he it was like his biggest thing that you always have to be ready for pivot. His book was called "Only the Paranoid Survive." <laughs> uh, you always have to be ready <laughs> like for that. change. You always have to be ready for disruption, and that one that stuck with me a bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's uh, yeah, that's really excellent. Um, yeah, yeah. You gotta be ready to pivot. Yeah, you never know what can happen, and you know, you, you know, like I think one, one thing you mentioned in your book is, you know, you 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 buy uh, you know, you spend two hundred dollars on a bunch of fidget spinners, and, <laughs> and then you, and then the market dries up, and you can't fit them all in your garbage can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it was a uh, Logan Paul phone cases. I think that all right. Was the, that's another way. No, nobody likes Logan Paul. <laughs> well, I don't know. Some people do. It's crazy, crazy world out there. Right. I mean, that's the other thing is, is the, the thing about economics, and this is what I love about business, okay, is that, um, you know, some people say, okay, it, it, that you're working for yourself, okay, that you're your own boss, right? But um, actually, I don't like to look at it like that, because even if you're an entrepreneur, and even if you created the company, you are not your own boss, the consumer is your boss, the consumer determines if you survive or fail, right? The market so ulti- writes your paycheck, right? The market rates are pay. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So you always have to be sensitive and cognizant of what people want, supply and demand, you know, where the market's going. Um, you know, you always have to be aware of that, acutely aware. And if you're not, you know, you're just going to, 
you're gonna you're gonna fall by the wayside. You're gonna be in the trash bin of, of economic history. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to remain objective to what what the marketplace wants. Uh, they they vote with their wallets. You know they they don't they might say yes. oh yours is the coolest, but at the end of the day, they vote with who they send money to. You know what? You know, and and uh, yeah. So on this show, we we discuss a little bit of uh, of uh, you know the state and democracy and and the, and the failings of those things. And one thing that I often say is the only democracy I support is voting with your wallet. Why? Because it's this is what capitalism is. It's the market transactions that occur when people um, buy and sell things in the marketplace. That's the only true democracy. Right. There is no ruler determining which business, you know, aside from the fact that let's say laws don't play an exa- a role, you know, which they do. But let's say they don't. Then then what really determines if a business survives or not is if you're able to please the customer. Right. And then they come back wanting more. They're voting with your dollars, patronizing your business and ensuring that your business will survive and thrive. Right. And that is the only democracy because it's th- it, it survives on voluntary interaction, which is inherently peaceful. Right. And also voluntary interaction makes the world a better place, a happier place. Why? Because when you when people trade, they're taking two things that each of them values less than what they're trading for. Right. If, if somebody buys you, uh, a subscription to your chess club, they they part with the forty dollars, which they believe is less valuable than the chess experience that you're giving to their kids. So they're happy, right? And you can you can hear this when people when you go to the store and everyone and you say thank you and then they say thank you. Everybody yeah. says thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's everybody's happy to do it. It's a win win for all, and that's how you know that it's a good deal if everybody's happy. Yes, yes, and I remember in one of your podcast episodes you mentioned about Disney. You say Disney. They are like masters at separating people from their money. <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll like take thousands of dollars from you and you'll smile while they I do know. it. <laughs> I know. I, I remember listening to the episode in, my, in the car with my kids about, about um, uh, you mentioned how they were actually getting annoyed because there are so many people were coming there. It was so congested. They're like, you know what? We got to raise the prices for this. <laughs> Even was, when they raise they do the anything. <laughs> People still kept coming. Hey, that's a good problem to have, you know. <laughs> that's, a, that's an excellent problem to have. Yeah, I just don't know what to do with all this demand, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll trade. I'll trade spots, Disney. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Definitely. So, uh, another. Um, uh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. No, another um, point that I found in your book pretty fascinating was the idea of delayed gratification. Right. And 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 when you, you're teaching, you're, you're saying that, you know, if you spend all your money, you know, a person can makes a paycheck and they just blow it on a lottery or they blow it on, I don't know, movies and toys and video games and lattes or whatever. Um, and they're not investing in themselves. They're not improving their skills. Right. They're, they're not investing in their future. Um, that is a set that is a, a you know, a setting up for failure. Right. So so what, what do you, what's your. Um, how would you go about talking about delayed gratification with people? How that's important? Yeah, so I barely spend any of the money I make. I'll, I'll spend like a little bit here and there. On maybe if I'm out to lunch or something uh, at the coffee shop. But for the most part, I save every penny that touches my hands. And because I know that in the future, it's going to be, I'm going to be able to invest in something big. I'll be prepared for potentially some big opportunity. Like, you know, maybe back when the fidget spinner craze in, uh, was it 2017 or was it even 20? No, it was 2016. Oh man, I'm getting old. (laughs) But (laughs) in 2016, maybe if I had thousands of dollars on hand, I could have bought some of those fidget spinners and resold them for massive profit margins. If, if I had the money and I was aware of it and if I was aware of it, then yeah, I would have, I would have been in a good position to make a lot of money. And it's good to have, it's good to have lots of cash on hand at all times for anything that might pop up. Yeah. There's a, there's a great um, experiment that I, I, I heard about where they um, they're determining if um, kids have uh, this understanding of delayed gratification and that, or yeah, the, the postponement of reward. So they said to kids, um, I don't know, probably like four years old around that age, three, three or four, um, they're like, okay, I'll give you one marshmallow now, or I'll give you two marshmallows in 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I heard this. And like, if the kid waited for 30 minutes, they'll be like, okay, you can have two marshmallows now. Or if you want to wait for an hour, we'll give you four. Yeah. And it was, and basically I think that what the studies 
hypothesis was that the kids who waited the longest were most successful in life. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that also uh, fundamentally um, distinguishes us from animals in the sense that we have foresight. We can see the future. We can, we can try to predict things and we can plan for the future. We can store seeds. We can save for the winter, you know, and, and have foresight like that. So, so um, yeah, I think that, I think that's, that's really, that's so important. Delayed gratification. Um, and, and, you know, that, that brings up another thing. You said that you barely spend um, any of the money that you make. And, and I think to me that, that brings up um, uh, a common um, vilification that people have for entrepreneurs and maybe, maybe wealthy people in general that, you know, you people are all, all about money and all you, all you want is your, uh, you know, your nice car and your nice clothes and your nice house. You're so materialistic. And, and, what's, and what's funny is usually mo most of most entrepreneurs uh, or a lot of entrepreneurs are driving the crappy car and we're, you know, because they're saving up for maybe investing in their business, you know, putting their profits back into growing their business. Yeah. Meanwhile, you'll see Lamborghinis parked in the housing projects. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. Or, or, or these people with, uh, with, uh, you know, in, in those, in those kinds of places wearing like the most expensive sneakers, nice watches. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> they, they got like, they got like, they, <laughs> I mean, they, they don't even have jobs and somehow they got these sneakers. And I mean, I even back when I lived in New York City, I knew kids who like wore the Supreme stuff. I'm like, how much did that cost? He's like, oh, this one, this is a knockoff. So it was only a hundred dollars and it was a wallet. There was like the wallet was worth more than the, than the money inside of it. <laughs> it was the craziest That's thing. Funny. I'm like, how much does the real one cost? He's like, oh, about 800 bucks. I'm like, who's spending 800 bucks on a wallet? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean the, yeah, the, I mean, we could talk about a little bit about the welfare state that how, how that has um, ensured that people stay in poverty because people have kind of figured out how to game the system and, and how to figure out how to secure their government handouts and they teach their kids this. And so it's like intergenerational um, secured poverty, you know, and it, and it's so tragic because then if you have one generation that tries to get out of poverty, then then you have like this, I think it's called a, a welfare cliff where it, the amount of benefits they're getting, let's say they're, they're getting like $60,000 of benefits a year. And then they, and then they try to earn some money and get a job. And, and then they start earning like 30,000. Then they feel that hit that, that $30,000 hit of loss of benefits. And they're like, why would I even try to be productive? It's, it's better if I just stay on, you know, welfare. Yeah. When well, we were driving down to Florida from New York, we uh this is in april i think we heard we overheard the guy at 7-eleven talking with one of the employees actually i think they were both employees and one of them had like a nice car outside and the other employee's like oh how are you gonna pay for that and he's like oh well i uh if, if she said how are you gonna pay for that if you're not working here it's like oh well the the unemployment benefits are more than the pay i get for working here and it's like well that's one way to get people to not work if right. they make more not right. working than right. working yeah yeah, it perverts it perverts the incentives to be productive, is what it does. It pays people to be idle, which is which is very tragic. You know, it's very tragic. Um, but yeah, that's the uh, that's the welfare state that we live in, and and I know that you're doing a lot to try to rectify that. So I'm very appreciative of that. Um, so another another uh, issue that you mentioned, which was a good topic, is um, time is a resource we all have. And how we spend it distinguishes the productive and successful from the unproductive and sloth. So can you go into that a little bit? Yeah. So people say time is money. I actually disagree. Money, there's infinite money out there. You could you can make lots of money, lots of money, but you can never, ever, ever get even another second. So right. how you how you spend your time, it's very important. Now you could spend your time, especially if you're a kid. But I know grown-ups do this. <laughs> you could you could waste hours playing video games. That's gonna add absolutely nothing to your life. If, right. Or you could spend even just maybe you're gonna play play video games for eight hours that Saturday. Maybe you just play it only for seven hours. You spend one hour, just one <laughs> hour working on yourself. And I guarantee you, the person who spends one hour working on themselves, working on their businesses, uh, maybe reading some book that's gonna like help them make more money. I guarantee you, they're gonna be infinitely more successful than the person who play, who just plays for the full eight hours. And the person who doesn't play video games and works the whole eight hours, they're going to blow the other two out of the park. Yeah, and, and the other thing that, that is so important is, um, is to have marketable skills. Like in my mind, 
it's not necessarily important how much money you have, right? Because money can come and go, right? You can, you know, lose your money for whatever reason. Um, you know, you can, it can be taken away from you. But what can't be taken away from you is your use, your skills, the skills that you had developed in yourself, right? So, and you can take that, go anywhere in the world, build an, a life for yourself because you have economic value. You know, that is so important. Um, and, and that's, that's what, uh, you know, that's what I'm trying to teach my kids. I think that's what you're trying to teach kids in your book and with your podcast that, um, you know, it, <laughs> I saw this, uh, this interview recently where the guy said, um, if you tell a janitor that he's making less money than, uh, let's say the CEO of, of the company, because he has low economic value. I mean, it sounds kind of, uh, it sounds kind of insulting to the janitor, yeah. but it's the truth. You know, it's like, how else, how else are you going to put it? <laughs> yeah. It's chapter four of my book. It's all about how to learn skills because it's really that important. You know, CEO, he has way more skills than the janitor. The janitor doesn't have those skills. And, you know, people might say, oh, well, the janitor is a nicer person. Well, it doesn't matter. The janitor doesn't have the skills that the CEO has. Right, right. And that's why the CEO is a millionaire and the janitor is not. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that brings up another fascinating topic that that uh, I like to discuss is um is about prices and wages. You know, some people have this idea that when businesses offer a product for sale, they like they like pick a price out of the sky, and just put it on there, and like I guess it's worth two hundred dollars. Or or when they hire someone, they just pick a wage out of the sky and say, I guess I'm gonna pay you twenty thousand a year or or whatever. But when in fact there's um, real, um, there's a, a, a you know a, a real mechanism that's occurring for them to arrive at that price or at that wage, and you know it's based on competition, based on supply and demand, based on how other businesses are doing, what the market is like, you know what the climate is like, and so they have to be very careful what prices they put on the their products or on their or the wages for their for their um, for their employees, because if they don't, they're going to lose customers or they're going to lose employees. Yeah. It's people, people don't realize this. They think, Oh, like, especially like the people who say, Oh, we, we there shouldn't be any rent landlords. They don't provide anything. They're, they're leeches. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, rent should be free. Rent is a human right. And it's like, <laughs> right, right, right. first of all, they, they don't, I don't think they realize how much it costs to build an apartment building, <laughs> right. and but also and maintain. They, they also, they pay for it. They, 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 they shouldn't complain. They don't like it. All right, well, then you don't have to live in the apartment. Nobody's pointing a gun to your head and saying, <laughs> you must pay $3,000 a month and live in this apartment. <laughs> Nobody's yeah. doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's so easy. Like, like in this, in this climate right now, uh, you know, there's um, a large percentage of people that are attracted to um, communist type philosophy, Marxist type uh, philosophy, where they're vilifying um, the capitalist, you know, the capitalist pig is, uh, like you said, is uh, getting all the money and he's in his, he's in his room and he's, uh, you know, doing all his paperwork, but he's getting more, more money than the worker who's doing the actual work. You know, how unjust is that? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's ridiculous, especially among the youth. Uh, it's, it's popular among the youth, especially because, you know, 50 years ago, somebody might have had like a relative or a friend who like lived in a communist country. Now I've, I've had actually a friend, funny story. It was at my church's youth group in the city. And one of the kids there, he was talking about how he admired uh, socialism and socialist countries such as uh, China and Venezuela. And now what's really funny is one of the youth leaders, he actually was from Venezuela. And uh, he, he was not, he didn't think that was very funny at all. <laughs> he was, he's like, are you kidding me? Uh, Venezuela? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah, kids, they don't. They don't. They haven't seen the horror. You know, they don't. They don't. I don't think they teach in schools that hundreds of millions have died right. from communism. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's. Uh, yeah, communism is one of the most dangerous ideologies the world has ever seen. Uh, unfortunately, but but most people tend to romanticize it with the the current um, you know presidential candidates that are that are running for office now. But um, but anyway, another interesting um aspect of this is the idea of money. And the vilification, actually, I like to say currency more accurately put. In my mind, uh, I draw I draw a distinction between money and currency. Um, uh, I don't know if you know, have you heard of Mike Maloney um, from Gold, goldsilver.com? He, um, he made this documentary series called The Hidden Secrets of Money. Excellent, excellent um, documentary. I highly recommend it. It's like, uh, it's all free on YouTube, half hour 
mini documentaries. He made like um, 10 so far. Excellent teaching about kind of al along the lines of what we're talking about economics, business, um, and the difference between money and currency. And he talks a lot about precious metals. And so basically real quick, the difference between money and currency is currency has um, it's fungible or interchangeable. It's durable, divisible, portable. And it's also um, a unit of account and a, um, and a medium, uh, sorry, a, 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 a unit, yeah, a medium of exchange and a unit of accounting, right? And that's currency, which is what all currencies on planet Earth of all the countries have. But then what distinguishes that from money is a storage of value over a long period of time. And historically, only gold and silver have become a store of value over a long period of time. So that's, um, so yeah, so, so, so he talks a lot about that. And, and basically the idea that people right now vilify money. And also this is um, translated as people hating on billionaires, you know, millionaires, billionaires, just people with a lot more wealth than, than them. <laughs> it's a lot of resentment, a lot of hatred for that. Um, but really the way I look at it is if a person has, is very wealthy to me, what that signifies is they have served as long as, you know, they're not, you know, using the state um, to get all this protectionism and, and procuring all these profits or, you know, doing some kind of, I don't know, profiting from wars, whatever. But if they did it in the market, satisfying consumer demand, the fact that they have a lot of money to me makes them a wonderful person because it means like in your book, I think you mentioned, um, if you want to, if you want to get a billion dollars, you should learn how to help a billion people. Right. So, so currency is, is the indicator that you have helped many people, right? So you are serving in capitalism. You are, in order to get money, you have first have to serve people, right? So, so yeah, that's, that's how we look at it. That. Go ahead. So can you elaborate on that? Yeah, people don't understand that these days. They think, oh, uh, you, you get money by being greedy and by being, they, they, they're like, oh, Jeff Bezos, how dare Jeff Bezos have all that money? He needs to give it to the poor. <laughs> right, and right. like, meanwhile, they've got like Amazon Prime subscriptions. I don't think <laughs> right. they realize the irony yes. of it. They're, they're like ordering the communist manifesto <laughs> off of Amazon Prime. <laughs> I know, that's the funniest thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they don't understand that Jeff Bezos, he's the richest man in the world because he's, help probably the most people in the world. I mean, I love Amazon. I, we get things from Amazon all the time, yeah, right? Yeah. We use Kindle, Amazon. Amazon's probably, it's probably like one of the most convenient things to, to exist because before you wanted something, oh, you had to go to the store. Now you can just push a button. It's at your house in two days. I mean, that's life-changing <laughs> almost. And No, it is. Yeah, you're right. So people people don't get that and they're like, oh, well, they're like, oh, and even like people like Warren Buffett, they're like, oh, how does Warren Buffett have that much money? All he does is manipulate people's, all he do is all he does is manipulate money and he, he makes a fortune from that. Well, they don't understand well, Warren Buffett. He's helping other people make lots of money. Right. Even, even my personal business mentor, Dan Kennedy, he's a, he's a big direct response marketing guy. He's, they call him the millionaire maker. He's rich because he has made other people rich. Yes. Yes. That's, that's exactly how I view capitalism is a, it's a win-win situation, right? You can only, you can only um, uh, increase your wealth by helping other people solve their problems, right? And, and I think that's what you mentioned in your book. You have to figure out, you know, <clears throat> you have to figure out a problem in society and attempt to satisfy it. And if you can do that well, an another, uh, another quote I think by Albert Einstein is, uh, is uh, don't, try to, don't try to create, or don't, don't try to make money, try to create value right? That that's the most important thing. You create value, you solve other people's problems and the money or the currency will come as a result. Yeah. People, people are in business to make money for themselves and they're not in business to help other people. And then they don't make, they don't do either, <laughs> right? If you start by helping other people, creating value, then you'll find that you get money for it. Yeah. So, so another, another, uh, topic that I found in your book uh, that was interesting is the idea of, or the myth of job security. People think like, you know, I, I can't, um, <clears throat> I can't uh, start a business because I got a family, I got kids, I got a wife and I got to pay my mortgage and I can't, I can't start a risky business because it might not, it might not pay off. So I better stay at my, you know, corporate job. Um, and they, they feel like they have job security. Whereas, um, uh, or actually, no, I'll, I'll let you go on. Yeah. So, how would you how would you uh, respond to that about job security? 
Well, I think we can just take a look at uh, earlier this year to find out just exactly how <laughs> right. a lot of people's jobs were. Uh, <laughs> like, that's a good point. Places were going bankrupt, you know, people were getting laid off. Uh, people couldn't go to work. And, you know, with business, even some businesses got to take away. But personally, my business, I, it wasn't affected by it. The only thing I couldn't do was sell my book on the street. And that, that was about it. <laughs> Other than that, business was on as usual. And yeah. people, but jobs, job, you're at the whim of corporate overlords who can, mm. and even the government, they can, maybe the government like passes a new law in your industry and it completely cripples your company. Right. And all of a sudden you don't have a job anymore. So yeah, job, it's, it's a risky thing to rely on. Yeah. yeah there's a great guy uh, on YouTube called Suli Breaks and he made a, he made a, um, a, uh, a video about uh, job, J-O-B, he calls it just over broke. <laughs> yeah <laughs> did you see that i i haven't heard i feel like i've heard that before but i haven't heard of uh, i haven't heard of him okay yeah he's pretty cool um he's like a like a rapper type uh <clears throat> type or like um like like uh, what do you call it um spoken word like poetry type stuff um but yeah yeah like um yeah it's so important you're right you know um to not depend on other people for your economic welfare you know when you when you invest in yourself, when you when you make sure you are constantly educating and creating new skills that you can market, that you can sell, um, you are creating your own job security. You know, it, it, job security. Going to a job and knowing it's there—that is a myth. And also, the other thing is, at the same time that people are vilifying CEOs um, and business owners for being these uh, wealthy jerks, is that these people are the ones that are creating the jobs for you to go. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's the like eat the rich. They if, if the rich were gone, they'd be dead. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like like I, I use iPhones, right? I'm very happy to use an iPhone. It makes my life better. You know, I have no problem that Apple, you know, is like a multi-billion dollar company or Steve Jobs when he was alive was a multi-billionaire. I have no problem with that. No issue yeah. with Steve Jobs. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, these people are on Twitter like, oh, we need to we need to end capitalism sent from my iPhone. <laughs> yeah, sent from my iPhone. Oh, my goodness. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah I, th- I saw the fun meme where it's like you see these you see these people protesting about, you know, down with capitalism and, you know, you know, they got the communist sign and everything. And that people are like, uh, you know, commenting on their, you know, if you people would just stop clicking on the free iPad commercials on Facebook <laughs> and you get your lives together, <laughs> maybe you would have some sense of what's really going on. Oh yeah. It's just funny because I, I don't want to sing. I don't think I have a single thing in my house that was created by communism. <laughs> everything I have, the computer, the microphone, oops, my phone, everything, all the, all the books behind me, this house, it was created by capitalism. Yep, exactly. The only, the only way, see, capitalism and civilization are synonymous, right? Go together. How, how can you have a, thir- uh, a flourishing, thriving civilization without free trade and voluntary transactions and, and people creating value and people patronizing that value? I think yeah, people are like, oh, it's capitalism versus communism. No, it's normal how society functions bef- versus like a false ideal that is never attainable. Right, right. Yes, yes, and my uh, my wife actually knows the intimate um, side of that because my wife is um, half Romanian, half Hungarian, and she grew up in communist Romania um, mm. in the eighties. So, so she's very much um, aware of of uh, that, how that worked, and how um, how much of a failure central planning is. So, so yeah, awesome. Um, so let me see here. <clears throat> oh, there's a, another great uh, topic that you mentioned in your book: um, the difference between being a consumer versus being a producer and how the the economy runs on investment savings and production and not consuming so can you elaborate on that yeah so like i say in the book even this is like a this is like a new time in humanity because a couple hundred years ago you built your own house you grew your own food right you 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 made your own clothes you made your own products you you did you did everything yourself now it's the opposite we just we buy everything from other people from the producers yeah and meanwhile we're consumers are the poor ones and the producers are the ones making all the money because they just actively make things for the other world for the rest of the world yeah 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. That's that's so true. Um, I would also add to that that um, the very fact that we don't have to have to um, sew our own clothes, grow our own food, or build our own homes gives us the luxury and the time to be more productive, right? Because it's basically the idea of 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 specialization and the division of labor, right? Like like there's a lot of people right now that. Um, are trying to be self-sufficient, you know, and trying to do all that, maybe go into the woods and be off grid and, <clears throat> you know, grow their own food and, you know, have solar panels and make their own energy. And it's great if you can do that, but most people can't, right? And, and the very fact that we don't have to live like that, that people can actually focus on things like, for example, what you do, you know, teaching chess classes or, um, you know, having your magazine teaching kids how to be productive and entrepreneurial, the very fact that you can do that and we can buy from other people that focus on houses and food <laughs> is yeah. nice. Yeah, it is. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a luxury, you know, it's, I think uh, overconsumption is bad. I think you'll never become rich just by only, only, only consuming. Right. You do have to produce, but right. hey, I mean, this house, I didn't build it myself. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't make this computer myself. I didn't sew these clothes. No, no, you're so true that that so many people focus on consuming, consuming, then and and they don't focus on producing themselves, and and yeah, that's that's the uh, I think that's the real gold mine is when you when you become a producer, um, and 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 you can see it from the other side because so many people who are consumers they begin to vilify producers and entrepreneurs and business owners as being you know you guys are sitting all the money and you're not paying us, you're not paying us barely anything. You evil guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you <know? exactly. laughs> yeah, go ahead. No, I was just thinking how life would be miserable without all the producers. There'd be nothing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like like have people have this idea that that people who are own businesses are sitting on like piles and piles of cash and they just don't want to give it up to anybody. <laughs> they don't want, yeah. They don't want... Yeah, like CEOs are having snowball fights with balls of cash in their basement and they're like <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, and like, for example, okay, so so talking about delegating responsibility um, as being a way to be more productive, for example, you, like in writing this book, I'm sure you delegated out to someone, I don't know, to make the cover, or you yeah. delegated out someone to, I don't know, create the book, print the book, you know, so you did a lot of delegation, right? Yeah, I've got somebody to format it, uh, that I didn't really do a great job. <laughs> we had to finish the job ourselves, but we got somebody, we got Amazon to print it. We got paid some girl 20 bucks to make the cover. See that? And yeah, it's sure. I wrote the book, but I couldn't, you can't do, you can't do everything all by yourself. No, no, that's, and that's, that's the, that's one of the secrets I think of, of being economically successful and productive is you have to recognize that you you have to delegate at, at some point you have to delegate to other people that are more skilled than you you know you're you're probably good in writing the book but maybe you don't have as good artistic ability to make the cover right so yeah. so there's no problem at all in delegating that out to somebody who does right and and <clears throat> and oh here's another funny thing yeah, let me tell you this story so my my brother he's 10 years younger than me he has uh he wrote a couple of ebooks and he hired uh, a couple of people in like Thailand, Philippines, like that area of the world to, um, <clears throat> to make the cover and make, uh, you know, make the artwork. And, and then my mother uh, saying, you know, that, uh, that's horrible. You know, you're, you're paying this person only $20. That's so horrible to do this entire thing. You know, you, you're uh, exploiting this person. Right. And meanwhile, this person in the Philippines is so grateful. This woman, she was so grateful at my brother paying her twenty dollars, that she actually named my brother as as the godfather of her child. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Twenty dollars for them, you know, that's like it, it, I, I think like minimum. Like people in America are like, oh, oh, I can't believe I only got fifteen dollars for doing this. Fifteen dollars for that same task in the Philippines is like. I so I, my dad and I we were at a business conference and uh, one guy he came up and he was telling us about outsourcing. He was telling us uh, the Philippines how like even though you're only paying them five dollars an hour, that's like so much money for them, and they're like yeah. making more than surgeons. And yeah. so what me and my dad got out of it is wow, we should make a lot of money and move to the Philippines, <laughs> live like kings. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that's another possibility too. <clears throat> but uh, all right, well, um, so so before we wrap up, um, is there anything else that you wanted to leave? Any other? parting messages you wanted to give to the audience or or to kids or parents about your book or about being uh, successful or productive yeah absolutely so 
one of the big tenets of my book is that kids need to start making money as early as possible. Because you know, Warren Buffett, who said this in an interview, uh, he said he read a study when he was younger about how all they, they did the study of all the most successful people in the world at that time uh, in business, and they tried to see what they had in common. And they looked at their parents. They looked at you know what they did in school. They looked at all these different factors. And the one thing that all these super successful people had in common was that they started to make money when they were early, when, when they were young. Mm, and the earlier yeah. they started to make money, the more successful they became. So honestly, every kid listening to this, you should start making money right now. Here's something you could do today. You can go in your room, look at all the old things you don't want, all the old toys, electronics, clothes you don't want, and just sell them. You could put them on eBay. You could sell them to your friends, have a little yard sale. Just do that. You could do that today. Right? And that'll, that'll it'll do a couple things. One, it'll clean out, <laughs> clean out their room. <laughs> exactly. And two, it'll give them a little cash to get started for their next venture. Yes. And, and, and don't be afraid to fail, right? Cause you are inevitably going to learn from your failures. Yeah. If you're, if you're, if you're, if you, if you feel, if you fear failing, <laughs> you're, you're never, you're going to be, you're going to, you're going to fail at the, not fail. You're going to, you're going to completely collapse at the first obstacle right. at the first little right. slow down mistake, whatever. Right. Great. So I know that you, um, in your book, you, you love quotes, uh, you love, uh, you know, citing quotes from different people, and I love reading quotes as well. So I'm going to ask you this very difficult task of giving me your most, uh, your favorite quote of all time. What is your favorite quote of all time that you? Uh, <laughs> that There's you, so many like, good ones. To choose I know, from. I know. <laughs> well, I'll tell you my favorite person for quotes and Warren Buffett. And uh, every every issue of my magazine, I always have a quote from him at the back. And I think my favorite from him. Well, it's quite simple. Rule number one. Don't lose money. Rule number two. See rule number one. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Excellent. I love it. Thank you so much, John, for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Um, I would love to have you back on in the future. You know, you do. I'm sure you're going to be continuing to do other things in the business world and maybe write more books. And I'd love to come have you back on to discuss those. Um, so, yeah. Thanks so much, everyone, for listening. Um, you know, if you want to support the show, there's links below. Um, PayPal or Patreon, you can support me. Uh, a dollar show is all I ask. Um, if you if you find value from this, um, trade value for value. That's the capitalist way. If you find find uh, find value in this, help me monetize it. And and as I said before, um, uh, the 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 market of interaction, right? Uh, you vote with your dollars. Is the only democracy I support. So, voting with your dollars. If you want to see something more of in the world. So, thank you so much, John, and thank you everyone for listening. This is Peace Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the ConsciousResistance.com and the Liberty.com. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's Patreon.com slash Peaceful Anarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either, either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a magnificent day.